Now it is time to, to announce the first lecturer, the first uh, participant. Mohamed Turkanovic is an associate professor at, at the Faculty of uh, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Institute of Informatics, University of Maribor, Slovenia, and founder and head of research and development at the Blockchain Lab, also at the University of Maribor. He has brought rich experience from the business environment to the university, working previously as a developer, head of technical development, technical director, and owner of an IT company. Since 2018, he has been the head of Slovene EDIH DGSI and the University of Maribor coordinator for the Horizon 2020 project, Digital Europe for All, teaching data technology and data protection related subjects. His current research interests include advanced database technologies, cryptography, digital identities, and of course, blockchain. Uh, Dr. Turkanovic, welcome to our stage. And of course, our virt virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much. I hope my screen um, can be seen. So, um, if I may start, uh, thank you very much, Tanya, for this uh, long introduction. I will try to be shorter than your introduction, uh, about myself at least. Uh, so, it was it, it's kind to be invited, and uh, I appreciate this. Uh, I was told that um, I could share some thoughts uh, on my with the idea of my own, so I decided to discuss with you. Uh, the title are digital e-wallets uh, connected to SSI and uh, if yes, in which way? So uh, I will try to be as short as possible in the time, let's say time span of 15 minutes. So uh, because of this, I will have also to be very fast because there are a lot of things that we need to discuss. Uh, I, like, uh, I would really like if you could also uh, ask the questions in the chat and I, I would literally try to ex answer them as soon as possible later on. So uh, to introduce you to the topic, uh, in June of 21, the European Commission issued a comprehensive report on analysis of EIDAS regulation. So uh, with this, they stepped towards the EIDAS 2.0. What is EIDAS? I will talk about this later on, but actually everything started with this uh, video or with this presentation of uh, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, where she told us that they propose a digital identity for all Europeans, and this was in the in the in the year 2021. So EIDAS 2.0 actually foresees the design and creation of digital EU wallets. And the European Commission has actually enforced or is requiring from the EU member states, also from Slovenia and other member states, that by September 2023, all of them must offer their citizens a digital EU wallet with an EU digital identity in order to actually st step up towards the digital single market, which the European Union actually also wants. So we know that the European Commission is a complex, uh, let's say, structure. We have a lot of countries and also each country has its own, let's say, digital identity, also with support of e-identities in various forms. So these are all of the possible, let's say, new uh, digital identity cards, uh, let's say from Estonia to Lithuania to Slovenia, uh, etc., Germany, each country has its own scheme, each country has its own complex structure, how to deal with uh, identity, e-identity in terms of legal as well also in terms of technical specifications. In Slovenia, we have a structure which is quite, let's say, sophisticated in terms of the EU, let's say, average. Uh, the, Euro the, the Slovenian government has set up a so-called SE pass, uh, where you can also use your digital identity in various forms, also authenticating, identifying various forms, be it on a username password or an SMS password, a digital certificate, or through other services like also Recono, which also will be uh, uh, presented probably later on by, by, our, by my colleague Miha. Uh, so uh, the, what is EIDAS actually? The EIDAS in short term, it's actually an EU legislative and regulation on e-signatures 
and e-businesses in order to facilitate e-business. It actually regulates electronic identification for individuals as well as companies. The idea is that it encompasses the legal as well as the technical space on how to regulate, uh, let's say, signatures and uh, in order to support the e-businesses. In, in a short term, it enables or it wants to enable each EU member uh, or a citizen to operate digitally within its own country as well as in the other EU member state, meaning a Slovene could actually using his digital identity and a digital, uh, digital certificate, open a business or do some other e-government e services in Austria, Germany, or in any other state. In order to do this, EIDAS actually wants to help us. Well, if EIDAS does that, what's the problem? Before we go to a pro pro to the problem or the challenge, I just want to emphasize that EIDAS has also set up a, a different levels of assurances, like from the basic to the maximum level of assurance, where the qualified electronic signatures are actually uh, defined. And this is important because EIDAS has defined that uh, electronic signature signed using a qualified electronic certificate actually is equal to a handwritten signature according to EU law from EIDAS on, etc. So this is very important because actually it enables us to do, uh, let's say, also legal, uh, uh, legal let's say, actions uh, technically and digitally. So why EIDAS 2.0 if EIDAS 1 also in, already enables a lot of things? Well, the problem is that the EU identified that EIDAS and digital signatures and electronic identities are very badly used. Only 14% of EU citizens are actually using their digital identities and signatures on the national or EU level. So what are the disadvantages because of this? So the disadvantages, why are people not using EIDAS and other digital signatures and services are user friendliness. It's quite burdensome to use a qualified electronic signature, sign with such a signature or operate any other services. It's quite easier to use, let's say, single sign on by Google or any, anything else. Uh, in comparison with, let's say, with uh, electronic identities, which are provided by a national quali quali uh, qualified uh, national service provider, for example, or certificate providers. The second disadvantage is that we have a full, uh, there is a, not a full interoperability between member states. EIDAS wanted to have all member states within uh, one roof, but there are quite technical problems and there are member states which have still not announced their national schemes like Slovenia. And this actually does not enable, for example, Slovenians and, and Spanish or, and, or German and Spanish to actually uh, exchange or use uh, these services between each other. And another disadvantage which EIDAS did not actually envision is the idea to provide more control over citizens own the data in terms of uh, let's say uh, user centrism and also in privacy so these are disadvantages which brought to e the proposal of eidas 2.0 which actually is also called the european digital identity so the european digital identity has three components which are the core of it one is to strengthen national eids the second one is to enable the private sector to onboard on these services and not only of the public sector, like the e-government services. And the most important part which EIDAS envisions is that it should enable user control identities based on digital wallets. Okay, so what are digital wallets? So the EU digital wallets it, they are the main component of EIDAS 2.0. To shorten it, it they should enable actual managing user digital identities, legal and, and, and uh, uh, natural identities. These digital identities or wallets, they should enable authentication and authorization for the users towards public or private services. They should also enable safe storage and management of identifiers, keys, and other digital documents. We will come to the part what are these other documents are. They should enable selective disclosure 
of credential attributes, and they still, still should be compliant with EIDAS 1.0 to GDPR and other EU legal frameworks. And they should also enable the high level assurance of uh, digital signatures, which EIDAS 2.0 envisioned for the last one. So the digital wallets, they should probably be, uh, or the EU wants them to be probably or primarily mobile wallets, but it's also something we will discuss later on. So why digital wallets and why is the European Commission forcing digital wallets as the main components of the next, let's say, the digital revolution EU? Because we already know that we are using digital wallets in many, many aspects and, and people in the EU and all over the world are satisfied with the phone as the main gadget to do all digital businesses because we are already using them for COVID certificates. We are already using phones for paying for, for uh, uh, various payment services, be it using uh, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Google Pay, or any other. We are already using mobile wallets for various, let's say, online banking systems. Like in Slovenia, we have Mbills, we have uh, Mdenanica, NLB Pay. We are using also mobile services for, let's say, authentication, identification, like the OnePass from Recono, etc., etc. And the users are also using mobile wallets or, or digital wallets also for cryptocurrencies or other let's say digital tokens so but we know that they are not only uh, one type of digital wallets they are of course mobile wallets but we know about the desktop wallets we know about browser wallets we know about cloud wallets we know about hardware wallets. there are a lot of a lot of types of digital wallets and we, we do not have time to discuss them in more detail but let's go back to the EU digital wallets what are the use cases and why does the European Union want them to be for what they want to be used? So they could be used in the public sector or in the private sector. For the public sector, these EU wallets would be used for tax filing, for company registration, for enrollment to higher education study and other e-government services. In the private sector, these wallets could be used for enabling car rental, enabling bank account registration, enabling e-commerce, single sign-on, etc. So there are a lot of use cases where these digital wallets could be and should be actually used for. And what are the functionalities? And now I will start to come to the SSI principles. So these are the functionalities and features of the digital identity wallet, which the EU envisions. These functionalities are, for example, the wallet should be enabled to authenticate the user. It should enable the user to securely store its private keys for their certificates. It should enable encryption and decryption of data. It should enable import and export, but primarily they should also enable the receiving, storing, and managing of digital documents in the form of verified credentials and verified presentations because they should also enable the so-called selective disclosure and of course digital signing etc etc so what why, why is this important because to, to sh also shorten up we have a lot of different digital identity models uh, just to, to shorten up, we have centralized federative models like those based uh, on the uh, single sign-on and the fed federations of Google, Facebook, etc. We know about decentralized federative models where we have EIDAS, for example. But there is also another digital identity model, a uh, novel one, which is called self-sovereign identity model. And a self-sovereign identity model, I will, I will connect these two topics, EIDAS wallet and self-sovereign identity in, in, in the short term. They consist of a new paradigm where the user is the user of everything and holder of the data. Because, for example, now with, with the SSI, we would hold so-called uh, our verified credentials. Verified credentials would be documents which are given to us from issuers. They are digitally signed and they're holding information about who we are, what we are attest to be, etc. When we hold all of these documents, we could then share these verifiable credentials in form of verifiable presentations as a proof to a possible verifier. And these possible verifiers could actually then verify to digital signatures, cryptography, etc., that the documents that we and the claims that we are sharing are actually really signed by the issuer and that they give us the rights that they want to give us. So what are verifiable credentials? Verifiable credentials are just documents in a digital form, uh, similar to, let's say, public, or let's say, to similar to other, uh, uh, let's say, like the identity card. For identity card, we know 
to whom it was issued, who is the holder of it, what is the identifier, etc. All of these information for identity card can be put in a verifiable credential format where we have the claim, where we have the identifier, and where we have the issuer of the, the signature of the issuer of this, let's say, identity card. So the important part of a verifiable credential is that they should enable selective disclosure, but also the EU identity wallet should do. What is selective disclosure? Well, the idea is that if you want to state that you are, for example, older than 25 years old to, for say, to the police or to, to a, 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 let's say, a security officer, why do you need to give them all the information about yourself? Where do you live? When? What's your ID number, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Why don't you just state and show him the information about how old are you, not other information? And this is called selective disclosure. This selective disclosure could be uh, brought back to brought further on uh, a step further where you just would show the officer or anybody who is the verifier only the information they're interested to without disclosing any other documents. This could be improved or uh, used with ZKP or zero knowledge proof protocols. However, uh, in order to facilitate this, well, now we come to the part where we have the issuer who is actually issuing such verifiable credentials and signing them. Well, when you issue such a verifiable credentials, you can sign them using uh, EIDAS electronic identity, or you can use them using a decentralized identity. Well, this is a short description of what a verifiable credential looks like. It has its adjacent format. Of, uh, usually, it holds the credential subject and it holds the issuer. The issuer could be a decentralized identifier or a classical EID EIDAS identifier. Well, what is a decentralized identifier? Decentralized identifier is based on the decentralized identity model, the self-sovereign identity model. Decentralized identity actually comes from the name of a decentralized identifier, meaning that you have created this identifier by yourself, not the government, and they didn't give it to you. These decentralized identifiers, they should be permanent, they should be resolvable, cryptographically verifiable, decentralized, etc. They actually are based on private and public keys. Public keys are known to the community and to the public. Of course, the private keys are the ones that you are managing this decentralized identifier uh, with, and it should be kept private, of course. And there's, there are these called decentralized identity documents where they hold the information about your public key, about your address, and if you are a legal person, more information about who you actually are. So why do we use them and where is SSI coming into the play? Because when we would use a self-sovereign identity within a wallet, there already exist self-sovereign identity wallets, which enable you to actually store various verifiable credentials and various DIDs. Well, there are already a lot of them on the market, Trinsic, Lisi, Gattaca, etc. There are a lot of them, but they are purely SSI and they are not actually also fulfilling all other EU identity wallet requirements. So uh, the idea with the issuer is also that what is a decentralized identifier? Well, if you are issued with a verifiable credential, having like an issuer, a decentralized identifier, the question is, who is this issuer? Who is this did example and random number? You need to have a system where actually the verifier would have to be able to verify the idea who is the issuer of the verifiable credential. For this, the SSI principle actually uh, uses the blockchain ledger. In order to store public identifiable information about uh, DITs on the ledger, and when a verifier actually wants to see who this issuer is, he could actually use this DIT, go to the ledger, and pick up the information about who actually this DIT belongs to, and then believe that this is the right issuer, and it was really signed by the issuer who it was attested to. So this is how it probably uh, in terms looks like every verifiable credential is also signed to. But in order to have such a system, you need to have a government framework, not only verifiable credentials, uh, did methods, etc. which is quite technical. You also need the governance framework. And now we come to the FCSE part, with, which probably uh, uh, our colleague Alan will describe later on in more detail. But EPSI has already started to uh, use case this. Uh, we were also part of one of the, for example, Slovenian uh, use cases for diploma use cases. It was tested between uh, Portugal, Spain and Slovenia. For example, where Slovenian students, as you see here, could join and log into a 
e-portal of the Slovenian government, uh, then connect this, uh, use a verifiable SSI agent, in this case, SSI wallet, to scan a QR code, connect the wallet with the uh, uh, Slovenian government's agency, uh, and then this Slovenian government would issue to the student uh, a verifiable credential and his diploma, and then the student would collect within this SSI wallet his diploma, digital diploma, which was signed and, and uh, by the, uh, the Ministry of Slovenia. He could then later on send it, send it to a possible verifier in Spain or Portugal. So our approach was something specific because in our case, we enabled the student to actually log in and authenticate to the Slovenian government using eIDAS. However, when the, the student was given the diploma, it was given in the verifiable credential form and signed using a decentralized identifier of the Slovenian government, which is how, which was, however, onboarded on the EPSI-ESIF framework. Why is this important? Because they're still not really sure how the EU identity wallet should look like, because there are a lot of possibilities in the terms of identity. These could be, and they should be, they should actually support eIDAS in eID, but they could also support the decentralized identifiers. The authentication, it could actually function on the principle of, of SAML or OpenID Connect, or they could also function on the terms of decentralized identifiers, verifiable identities, verifiable IDs, which maybe Alan will explain later on more in detail. The communication itself can again function uh, on the DITCOM level or using just plain SOAP on HTTPS. And the data itself, it probably will surely be a verifiable credential, but again, it could be maybe in the XML or JSON format, etc. These are some things which are not defined purely, but uh, as I said, the decentralized identifiers, SSI, and the EU identity wallet, as you see here, this is a reference architecture for it, could actually uh, be joined uh, 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 in, in short term. So I, I apologize, I was quite longer, um, and that's, that's from my point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, not a problem, I think, with the length. Uh, it was very, very educational, I think, uh, for, and uh, very useful for the start. 